Everything is for free in the camps. Everything is for free in the Haima, too. Okay, so I'm just going to start. I'm Robin, and I'm the artist, and this is a tent from the refugee camps in Western Sahara, no, in Algeria, I'm sorry. Um, but the people there are Saharawi, and they've been there for 38 years, and um, because their country, which is, you can see on the map there, it's in Africa, and uh, above it is Morocco, and below is Mauritania. It's on the Atlantic coast. And when uh, Franco was dying in 1975, he wanted to give the country back. It was called Spanish Sahara, but give it back to the indigenous people, and he had made that promise. And then at that point, the Moroccans came in and invaded, and they've been there for 38 years. And in that time, they built a wall which is that red line, um, where they have all the natural resources on the Atlantic Ocean and under the earth in the occupied territory, and the people who are there um, have no human rights, even though it's their indigenous uh, uh, country. And that's one third of the population lives there, and two thirds have been living in the camps, so these people are separated. And to make matters worse, they're separated by a wall that was finished in 1990, and it's the largest mined wall in the world, and hardly anybody knows about it. So um, I, as an artist, have been working with women's issues and working in collectives, and I saw images of Western Sahara from a friend who went to this art festival, Arti Fariti, and um, when I saw them, I didn't know anything about the people, where they come from, what their story is, and I was super surprised. And so I decided to go to the refugee camps and to live with the women for a month and just hear the story from them. And so what came out of it is this book, which I made while I was there, which is about my experience being in the camps, and it's called Dining in Refugee Camps, The Art of Sahrawi Cooking. And these are the women. <laughs> And that is the flag, which is the Polisario, the government in exile's flag, their actual flag that they have, which you see everywhere here. Um, so the refugee camps that are in Algeria are in the hottest part of the desert. It's called El Hamada, La Hamada. <laughs> and everybody speaks Spanish there because it was Spanish Sahara, and it, was, and it is the last colony in Africa. And um, the refugee camps are named after the, um, the big cities that are in the occupied territory. So they have the same name. And, and when the people fled across the desert, um, as bombs were being dropped on them in the 70s, they um, reestablished themselves in these temporary homes with the same names of the big towns that they came from. So when you go to the camps, this is pretty much what the buildings look like. And they're, because the people had nothing, at first the women went across the desert and they took off their melfas and they um, shelter, gave shelter to the kids and the older people. And um, they were the ones that organized the society, which was didn't exist yet. And then uh, slowly but surely there was humanitarian aid and everybody gets a uh, haima, which is what we're in right now, and uh, it changes every seven years. Or it's, you know, it's recycled by humanitarian aid every seven years. And that's pretty much the center of society in um, the Saudi cu culture. And um, the people are Berbers. Um, for, so they're nomadic and this kind of tent can be just <laughs> rolled up in about 10 minutes and taken in a very small package on a camel anywhere but well, we don't have camels in castle but um, and then the next kind of building was sand and water bricks and uh, now 38 years later each family compound has a series of buildings and with the Haima always as the center and all of these buildings were at first built by the women because there were no men there, they were all fighting. And uh, when humanitarian aid comes, it comes in trucks. So there are a lot of innovative houses like that that you see because 
it doesn't rain very often, but there's a lot of wind and this protects you from the wind and sandstorms and also if there is rain. And, but um, they all look a bit different. There are some people who just have set up like disco balls in their truck containers and that's the place where the whole family will go if the weather is inclement. Um, so here is um, an example. This is some of the things that the women do. Um, they obviously they cook and keep their families together and they they pass their traditions down and their history down to the kids that are being born there. So this is a grandmother who's my age. She was 13 when the bomb started dropping and she went on a camel across the desert with her family and that's her granddaughter. So there's now three generations living in the camps. And here's a kitchen um, and the meal is a big kind of uh, a peaceful way of a peaceful hospitality, drawing people in, inviting everyone in. And then while you're eating, uh, the eldest woman always sits and tells the story of her people as a way of transmitting uh, hope and dignity and their history to anybody and everybody because really this is a population that's almost invisible and um, they're, they're the ones who started the art festival, they started a film festival, they're a peaceful people, they've been in uh, peace since 1991 waiting for a UN referendum so that they can have their country back but it, that's a long time to wait and it, it, it seems that that's not the way that this is going to happen because there's not a lot of people in uh, the UN that want to help them. Basically, uh, the the women built all the houses. They built the school system. They created a cultural system inside the camps. There's a minister of culture who came here to Documenta and sat for eight hours a day and just engaged people in conversation in about five different languages that she speaks. And she really sees culture as something that can that can move. Um, uh, that as a way of transmitting uh, the story and that is an alternative to uh, you know the political um, stalemate that exists today. Um, there's 99% literacy in the camps and so when you think <coughs> refugee you know most people think oh they have nothing but in some way this matriarchal society it provides for the people and everything um, is done t to the nth degree because everybody thinks this is this could be my last day, so there's just this care that's given to everything. Um, nothing can grow uh, in the desert. That's a big garden, and um, <laughs> and my friend Federico took that picture because I did not find this garden, but obviously if that is happening, then whoever, whatever family has that would share that with the whole community. Um, so basically food comes from humanitarian aid. Um, the, this is one of the family compounds that I stayed in and water gets delivered in big trucks like that and then it, it's put in containers in front of the house and that's for bathing, cooking, um, for absolutely everything you need and you need to ration it out pretty well. Um, and this is a picture that was a poster on the wall that's about a humanitarian food drop that's going to happen. You never know where it's coming from or what the ingredients are. So this says potatoes, onions, and apples will come on uh, Wednesday. And, and, in, and 27 de Febrero is the camp that it was established by the women where uh, in order to teach literacy and to teach classes to other women. And so it's a women's center and it's sort of the this, this central place and the camps are around it. And so when, <coughs> when people get to be a certain age or women, then they, they will um, go into a kind of intensive schooling system there. But um, these women are wearing melfas and they're hiding their face because they don't want people to know who they are because they don't want to be um, subjected to donations. They would rather have their own land back and their own capacity to, to grow their own food. So it's actually really difficult to take a photo of them you know, in this routine because it's not something they really want to share with you. 
here's um, just stuff that I took from the garbage in, on the, uh, in the ground and in the camps. And you can see all these different countries um, and different languages. And these are from food containers that, um, that uh, were just discarded, basically. Uh, and here's, uh, this is split yellow peas coming from the United States. But basically, this is what they can count on is flour, sugar, pasta, rice, oil, some canned fishes, which is unbelievable because these people have the whole coast of the Atlantic Ocean where most of the fish are, and all fishing contracts are created there because there are no fish off the coast of Morocco. And um, one of the reasons that Morocco stays here is to create fishing contracts um, uh, with all different countries from Japan to Spain. And, um, so, and the other thing is phosphorus, which is, or phosphates, white phosphorus, phosphates, which is um, in the land that's occupied by Morocco is the largest deposit of phosphates, which is used for quick fertilizer, for quick growing food by multinational corporations who want to feed the hungry, as opposed to um, helping those people uh, develop, seed save and develop their own biodiversity. Um, so, if you get meat, it's from chickens or goat and um, camel. And the camels are a collective meat, basically, because it's a Berber society. And there are camels, but they're being eaten a lot. And um, they are killed early in the morning and at sort of, uh, at this as the sun is rising, you'll hear like that, and um, that's how you wake up instead of the rooster. <laughs> um, and then now, um, because it's been such a long time that this has been happening, there is commerce, and there, uh, people are allowed to leave, and they're allowed to have jobs in other countries for five months or so. I mean. The women that I met are cleaning ladies a lot at uh, tourist destinations in Spain, and the children are allowed at certain ages to leave for two weeks for summer vacations. There are uh, 28 to 10 year olds in Germany right now for two weeks, and um, Spain, is, the people of Spain are very supportive of um, the, the people from Western Sahara and have created a lot of different programs to bring kids into their families for summers and it's a way of engaging um, with the people from there and 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 putting a face onto a situation that's at, at this point faceless um, so these are some of the things that when people come back they can uh, uh, the men basically uh, they're the shopkeepers and um, there is really no money so <laughs> they have this odd exchange of all money they've collected and I nobody really knows exactly how it works when you go to buy soda or something it could be I don't know 3,000 pesetas or it's some kind of form of exchange but it's very confusing to me but since somebody's <laughs> understanding it <laughs> um, and so this is a picture of some local markets and when I was in, going there uh, the man who's he was very proud of this because his uh, sister had written Allah over the, mm -hmm. the door, and he wanted me to take a photo of that. And then this one is Photo Minuto. So they actually have cameras there. At this point, in the houses, they do have satellite dishes in some of them that are, that are um, either, you know, that are solar. And um, it's, it, it's amazing, because people will take a battery out of a car, and then they'll hook it up to a television, and they'll hook it up. And I did have an experience in the camps where I was cooking in a kitchen um, with these women who were telling me their story. <laughs> in the background, there were all these girls dancing, and they take off their melfas when they're at home. And um, they were dancing to an MTV video on Al Jazeera of Beyonce saying, want to put a ring on it which is like one of the weirdest experiences of being so far away. But, you know, they want to have a sense of what's going on, you know, in the world, but it was just very weird. 
Uh, I hear women waiting for gas. I was there and, you know, again, they're covering their faces. And gas is the way that they operate their fridges in some of the camps and also their ovens. So this would be a family that doesn't have an oven yet. And this is the mayor of Samara, um, her kitchen. <laughs> And then this is where I was staying. They, you know, there are all different kinds of innovation in order to figure out how to have the most comfortable life possible. Uh, there's the mayor's wife, uh, Fatima, and she made a, a, a beautiful meal. And this is a kitchen that I actually just walked by and I, I took a photo. Everything is immaculately clean, and um, a lot of families and and the women when they left they took one thing from their home and so uh, my experience was when I was making couscous Mahayar was telling me about her grabal that she took and it was a sifter for making couscous but it was something that her grandmother had touched and you know that was brought down and now she's sharing it with her children and that's you know one of the ways that they tell about their history. There's Mahayar she made couscous with me, and there you are. They don't make it like instant couscous in three minutes. Uh, no, not, there's nothing like that. They get, they get uh, the seed, uh, not the seed, the, the flour, like, uh, and they use the this whole system where the whole family sits together, all the women that is, um, and they pass it through this series of sieves and. Um, at the end, everything that goes down isn't used, but everything that stays on top is the couscous that they end up cooking. Uh, and here's just some examples of the amazing food that you get that's, you know, from a people that you would assume don't have, you know, the, or, and they don't have the means, but they actually have the artistry and the, uh, and the care to make these amazing meals. So. Okay, now this looks super fancy, right? But if you really look at it, this is beets and rice, this is rice, this is a little bit more beets and rice, this is beets and rice again, and this is beets. So, <laughs> but it's, look at that, that's unbelievable, right? So you, you know, you first see it, you're like, wow! And then you start to eat it, it's sort of like, it could have been all in one bowl, it tastes the same, but I mean, this is the presentation. Um, here I, that's me. And I went into the liberated territories, which are the territories in Western Sahara that are separated by the wall. And it's just a strip of land, but it's inside the country, not on the Atlantic Ocean. And it's all, there are a lot of mines there that are left over from the war. And I went to go make uh, bread in the sand, which is really interesting because, you know, that's a biblical recipe that you, I'm Jewish and I've always heard that when the people, left, they made matzah. And so this was um, something that everybody knows how to make. And I went in the liberated territories and we were um, digging sand and there was something shiny. And uh, one of the women said, don't touch it, don't touch it. And you know, it wasn't a mine, but the experiences of the nomadic people who live there, they do encounter mines. And, um, and it's tragic. And um, I don't even go into the story she told me, but it was she she knew some shepherd that had been hurt, and um, she got very upset. At, here, this is Najela, and she made it with me, and she went to her grandmother's house because her grandmother lives in liberated territory. She doesn't want to live in the camps. She wants to be on her own land, and even though there's no humanitarian aid there, she's she won't move. You know, so she's figuring out how to make her own, and and this is one of the basic recipes. So we're making bread in the sand. All of a sudden, this guy walks over. He's like, no, 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 es hecho como eso, muy malo. Like he, already, he had his own recipe. And he's from the Polisario, and he had been walking around and, you know, smelled it. <laughs> it was a way of joining the circle and telling us right away, oh, no, it's done this way. And by the end, it, you know, it started in the day. By the end, there's a huge circle of us all sitting around eating bread and warm bread under the stars. Um, there I am in the kitchen, and that's my first mom, Galia. And I stay when you when you go to this art festival, you sort of break into groups and you stay in a haima just like this, and that's where you take your meals on tables like this. And then at night, you sleep right there, and it's all head to toe, and um, and you sleep with the family, and you get to know them. Um, and I think that was the experience that was just so amazing to me that how 
how everyone opened their homes and opened their histories and their personal stories and just included me in this. Uh, it's certainly not my experience in New York City where, where I live. Um, so here, this is, I went to Salam's house. She's evidently an awesome cook, which she is, but when I went in, she was sitting there with the women and do you, if you want to do anything, you have to have tea, and tea is, it's not, it's not like 15 minutes tea, it's like a, I don't know, two and a half hours of tea, <laughs> and there's a special way to pour it, and you sit through three sessions of it. Uh, the first one is bitter, like life, the second one is sweet, like love, and the last one is soft, like death, and after you've had this whole life cycle, you pretty much know each other, and then you're invited into the kitchen to start there. Uh, this is the book that I made, and I was so excited when Documenta got the book and invited me here, and I brought so many copies and gave them all away the first three days, because that's what you do when you're in the camps. And But it is, uh, there's a yellow pamphlet here that I made for this, and it's the story of how the tank got here, and on the back, is a blog that you can just download this for free, or it's up at the bookstore and it's super cheap. It's like 10 euros or something. But it, um, it's the book that I made one in the camps and then I went back to New York and I thought, I'm gonna just go to NGOs and get out of the art world and try to bring this kind of artistic project into an, an, a, new, a new forum. And I went to all these NGOs, which are like International Refugee, IRC, and, um, lots of acronyms that are super important and people running around and I would get a meeting and I'd show them the book and they said this is beautiful but uh, Western Sahara is not on our list mm. so that was upsetting for me and I finally went to an anarchist press and they were like yeah well that, this is great so they published it they're called Autonomedia and uh, these are pages from the book that I just took my images that I recycle in my art and I took, uh, uh, yeah, here, that's one that I use a lot, <laughs> a lot to change it. It's a woman holding up a man, but that's pretty much the universal story. And, um, and, um, and then photos of the people who, uh, that I shared this experience with, who are people from the camps. This is a woman who, uh, was there during the occupation and um, during the war and she speaks French and her family is, um, they live in El Ayun, her family uh, is all women, uh, the men are in the occupied territory but she's adopted all these women and there are some that are deaf and some that are black, some that are brown skin, some that are white skin but they're all sisters and they're all a family. And she told me her story and said, this is so important because the world really doesn't know about it. And it was really an amazing honor because what I did is, well, these are other stories that are super cool, but wait, I just want to say, is the next year I got to bring the book back to the, to the camps. Mm -hmm. And this is my next mom, Hija Pio. I'm like 20 years older than her, but she's my mom she's like Robin calmate calmate you know put on your shoes she's always telling me but she's really got it together this is her daughter and her sister and they're reading the book and the great thing is there are pictures of them in the book and it's their story and um, I gave them all to that school that I was telling you about where the women are learning um, all different things but this is for their English class so it's a lot more exciting reading about yourself and your your own customs than reading like Jane sees the dog or whatever you know and it, it's great because everybody has one in their high mark. and um, I, this is my partner he brought uh, he brought the books because we have kids so I went the first year and left the kids and then he went the second year and I looked after the kids and he brought the books and that's his his mom <laughs> reading it and then the other thing that happened is through the anarchist press this, um, these are two, this is a poet, this is um, Peter Lamborn Wilson, who is a North African scholar and mystic, who wrote Taz, is one of his books, which is called, it's about the temporary autonomous zone. And he, through these channels, got a hold of the cookbook, and somebody gave me this photo. I didn't even know Peter then. But uh, Peter went to sleep after reading the cookbook, and he had a dream that women were cooking couscous in castle. 
because <laughs> Carolyn was going to have lunch with him soon, and um, he said, I'm old, I don't want to fly, you should show Robin Kahn, who's done this cookbook in solidarity with the people of Western Sahara. And so then I got a phone call, and hi, this is Peter Lamborn Wilson. No way. And <laughs> you know, I was like, Stephen, I, you know, I thought it was somebody joking. And then he said, how would you like to be in Documenta? I haven't met you, but I've read your cookbook. And so that was like the most amazing message on my phone. I like, I saved it forever. And since then I met him and um, he has supported this project coming here. And I went back to the camps and told the women and um, thank God for his dream. It's been a beautiful thing. And yeah. What is the cloud? Oh, Yogi one. Don't listen. This is my password. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's streaming. Yeah, we're, oh, we're streaming live into the camps right now. Yeah. Because they want to know what's going on in the Haima. Uh, so I went back. That's a picture of Couscous. And then this is this tent that is being made in uh, Camp 27 by the cooperative because it's all women's cooperatives. This is the tent cooperative. And here they are. Mm -hmm. And this is on sand. And we had I had a year to engineer everything and figure out how to make a home in exile here in Castle because what's the difference? They're living in a home in exile in Algeria. They're not in their land, so why not set it up right here? And um, I did really well with the floor and really well with the planning, but when they said it rained, I really didn't plan for that so well because you know, rain is not an issue in the desert. If it rains, everybody's like out up on the dunes going, ah, this is great. But um, I just didn't know about Castle Rain. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so I had eight women come from the camps for the first 15 days, and we set this all up, and they were singing and dancing, and I was like, you know, freaking out, basically, because the electricity wasn't working, and then our kitchen got condemned, and then... They wanted to cook with gas, and we didn't have gas, and um, then the rain came. <laughs> so everything was working out great, because as soon as it started, they're dancing, they're singing, they're having everybody dance with them. They're, this is a vacation. They're super happy. And um, then the tent started to fall. So we're holding sticks it up with sticks, and people are all coming here, because there's music, and it's raining, so there's a tent. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, and they're eating and having a great time, and we're just holding the tent up. So um, now we have this amazing, engineered in castle, rainproofing. That um, so we can travel anywhere. Basically, I'm very very happy about this new development. Here they are again, and this is the page that I designed for the catalog. And Mick Tausig, who's an anthropologist, who also has been really supportive of this project. He wrote the essay about it, and it's it's really beautiful. I'm super proud of this. <laughs> and um, these are the activities that would happen in the Haima, but this is happening in the camps. This is a wedding, mm -hmm. and this is a part of Arte Feriti. Um, it's people from Spain and from the camps sharing with each other. This is a super happy night during Arte Feriti, and that's just pretty much what people do in the in the Haima. <laughs> and another day. Um, usually, if it's hot, you just roll up the flaps, but these are like down forever because of the rain. <laughs> um, but it's a way of controlling the wind and also like making it great inside, making it super comfortable. And, um, and well, that's the plan. You don't need that. Okay, I'm going to, oh, and I'll end it there. So that's, I made a series of billboards that are very much like my cookbook and, um, ideas to enter and read a little bit and then come in and just you know enjoy a little bit of hospitality a la Sarah Howie. So thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.